Well, hey there. Welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, Tanner Campbell, and today you're going to get another long-form episode. But Tanner, you just had a long-form episode yesterday. We just got done listening to your conversation with Sharon LaBelle. That's right, you did, and don't get spoiled. This isn't going to be a regular thing, but it just so happens that three long-form conversations, maybe four, dropped into my lap this week, and rather than spread them out, I thought, well, it'd be cool to just drop them all in a row. Why not? All of you seem to like the longer-form episodes, so... Why wait? Let's just put them all down in a row. Today's conversation is with Eric Cloward. He is the host of the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. You may know it. You may even listen to it. But I wouldn't call this episode a conversation. It's usually the case that when I have a guest, in fact, it's always been the case when I have a guest on this show that I am very familiar with their work. I've read their books. I've listened to their podcasts. I've met them in person. We have some sort of relationship, either directly or through their content. But that is not the case with Eric. This is the first conversation I've ever had with Eric, so it really is more of an interview. And then I think tomorrow you're going to hear a conversation between Eric DeMott, that's the individual who does practical cynicism, and me talking about some other things. So that'll be another long-form episode tomorrow. And then I think if I can get it done, you're going to hear a long-form conversation between myself, Kai Whiting, and Chris Fisher of the Stoicism on Fire podcast talk about stoicism and war and how those two things do or don't and don't and do go together, how we as Stoics think about war and conflict. That, I think, is going to be a particularly interesting conversation because Chris is a veteran. But while he was in the service, he was not a Stoic. He became a Stoic after the fact. So that juxtaposition of in the military and not a Stoic and out of the military and a Stoic looking back retrospectively on the past, I think that's going to make for some really interesting talking points. And then, of course, Kai is always fun. And if we're lucky, there may be a fourth person joining, but I won't spoil that just yet. But today, again, I will be talking to Eric Cloward of the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. Eric defines himself as a modern Stoic, which means he and I probably disagree on a number of things, but that's okay. I think it's important to have other points of view on this show relative to Stoicism, because I'm certainly not the only resource for opinions on the philosophy. And I thought when I got the opportunity to interview Eric, maybe I'll have more Stoic podcast hosts on. And I think that's a good idea for a couple of reasons. First, it allows you to get a broader spectrum of opinions and decide you know, what you agree with and what you don't. And it also allows me the opportunity to highlight some other creators in the stoicism and philosophy space at large, which I think is a nice thing to do. But rather than babble on about this too much longer, I would prefer to just jump right into my interview with Eric Cloward of the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. Here it is, and I hope you enjoy it. Eric Cloward of the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. We have been never formally introduced. We've never spoken. (laughs) I've listened to your show a couple of times. I think maybe you've listened to mine, but I won't speak for you. But you've always appeared next to my show. I think I always appear next to your show. We should be best buddies. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you. So yeah, it's when... When I stumbled on yours, I'm like, oh, here's somebody doing very similar to what I do, but a little bit more intense. So, but I, I like your format. I like the kind of two episodes balance that you have going on. Um, I was thinking of doing something similar to that, although probably not twice a week, which is pretty impressive, I think. It's it's actually seven times a week now, so it's gotten even more oppressive. <laughs> but it is my full time gig, so I kind of if I don't show up every day, people will think I'm really slacking. Ah. But we now have two very calm voices on the show. I, I'm afraid we might we might put all of the listeners to sleep. But thank you for taking the time to do this. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, that's one of the first comments I get from most people. Like, hey, I love listening to your voice. It's so relaxing. I could listen to you read the phone book. And I'm like, well, thanks, I think. What I usually do is I start with guests by asking what their childhood is like. N- not not a put you on the couch therapy session, but trying to get a sense of what your background is, where you come from, because I think it helps to kind of pre-paint the story of how people wind up at Stoicism. Everybody takes different different paths, and maybe you've got a unique one. So where do you come from? What was your childhood like? And et cetera. Yeah. So pretty much grew up in Salt Lake. We moved to Virginia when I was, what, I think in third grade No, I'm sorry, fifth grade. So I spent a few years out there, which I absolutely loved living out there. And then we moved to a small town in southern Utah called Monticello. My grandparents lived there and had a business. And so we went down there and 
my grandpa and my dad worked together on a business for a while. And after a year of that, which was probably one of the strangest places I've ever lived, we picked up and moved back up to Salt Lake and I graduated from high school there. I was Mormon uh, at the time and ended up going on a mission to Austria, so I speak fluent German. And for me, it, it kind of uh, Austria was kind of the beginning of the end in a way of seeing a culture that was so different from the one I'd grown up in, where I found that the people were generally much happier and much kinder. So it really, that, that in a sense led me to really question a lot of the things that I'd been taught. You know, Mormons are very conservative, and unfortunately that also tends to fall into just towing the line of the Republican Party. They're generally a single issue voter, and that has to do with uh, abortion. And that's pretty much it. If you're uh, anti-abortion, then you, you're you pretty much golden in their book. You can be, you can, you know, disagree with them on everything else, but that's pretty much the one issue. And I found that, that over time that I really disagreed with a lot of the core principles of the church and just found, you know, as I dug more and more into the history and everything that, you know, and I know this will probably upset a lot of people, but that Joseph Smith really was a con man and he was kind of built on a house of cards. And once I understood and read his history and, and you know, really dug into what the church had, you know, hidden under the carpet for so many years, even long before I was born, I just, I just could not support an organization like that. I found that my beliefs differed from them. Their stance on plenty of issues just simply do not match with mine. And so I ended up leaving, and that was back in 2005, I think. And by that time, I had been married, had two kids, and I uh, got divorced a year after that. And let's see, how did I get into Stoicism? Uh, it was kind of a uh, an accidental thing. I listened to Tim Ferriss's podcast. Um, I had read some of his books years ago. And one of his episodes, he talked about William Irvine's book, The Art of Stoic Joy, I think it was, or The Guide to the Good Life, The Art of Stoic Joy. And he said that it was one of the best books he'd ever written and one of the most influential books in his life ever. And, you know, Tim reads a lot of books and he's not really given to hyperbole if he says, hey, this is pretty amazing. You know, I, I generally take him at his word because he hasn't disappointed me with plenty of other things he's recommended. So I ended up purchasing the book. I read it. And the first time through, interestingly enough, there were a lot of things that, that kind of clicked, but didn't like really click. It wasn't like this, like, oh my gosh, you know, there are a few aha moments here and there, but for whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't really sink in, which is kind of unusual because I usually am, am pretty good about that. So I took another shot at it and I bought the audiobook and would listen to that to and from work every day. And to, I think having it broken down in kind of those 15, 20 minute segments, you know, I had a lot more aha moments of like, oh, oh, okay. And just by the time I finished it that time, really a lot of the concepts had really sunk in. And that was the point where I was like, okay, this is something a little bit bigger than than what I was thinking it was. And this was back in 2017. And I think it was just before New Year's of 2018, um, I saw a thing on Amazon where it said, hey, buy Ryan Holiday's you know, Daily Stoic Journal. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll buy that. That'll be helpful for me. Started writing in that. And one of my New Year's resolutions was to start a podcast. I had been tried one a few years before. Uh, I'm really big into music. I like composing music. I'm really I love music as far as uh, film scores and soundtracks and stuff. So my idea was I would you know do one on film scores and stuff like that. But the copyright issues and everything were too complex, and and I also kind of psyched myself out about doing it. So then I was like, okay, uh, what do I want to talk about? I will just talk about stoicism because of what I'm writing about. And it was more of just the podcast originally started as just a practice. It was just like I'm going to practice making a podcast, and I'm going to put it out even if it sucks. Um, because before I would just self-edit too hard and I would never put anything out because it, it never felt good enough. So I just started recording on my iPhone and putting it out there. Even though I had all this great audio equipment, it was so overwhelming that I was just like, I'm just going to record on my iPhone and then push it out there and try different things with background music and not background music and everything. And originally titled it Stoic Meditations. And then there was found out there was another podcast already named that. So I was like, okay, what do I do? So I looked on under a whole bunch of donate domain names, um, you know, like a search engine and I saw stoic.coffee and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I, I like that one. And so I went ahead and bought that name and just rebranded as the Stoic Coffee Break. And I did 137 episodes in a row uh, as a daily podcast and reached the point where my girlfriend at the time was just like, yeah, that's really great. And I know that you made me promise you would at least make a hundred of them before you, you know, decided if you could quit or not. But I'd really like to spend some more time with you. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. So <laughs> this seems like a reasonable request. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, you know, and I didn't want to turn around and go, well, you told me I had to do a hundred because I had already pa surpassed a hundred. So I turned it into a weekly podcast. And part of the reason why was I also wanted to delve a little bit deeper into it. I did another 
oh, I can't remember how many episodes. I did quite a few episodes after that. And then I took a break from it just because I was burned out. I was too busy trying to do other things. Like I said, I also am really into music. And I, for a while, I really focused on that. I just kind of drifted. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. And then found that I was really missing the podcast. Um, so I came back. Uh, this was, after, I think, a year after COVID started. Did it for a year, then took another break again. And, you know, kind of burned out on some things. Some issues in my personal life were really dragging me down. And so I just needed to needed to work through a bunch of stuff before I kind of got back to it. And so then about six months ago, it was like, okay, I think I'm at that space where I can do this again and uh, picked it back up. And now I feel much more confident, much more comfortable and just kind of keep pushing forward on it. You kind of came to this in a similar way to the first way that I came to podcasting relative to stoicism. I had a podcast a long time ago called Epictetus is My Therapist, and it really was just as yours was when you started, just for me. It was me flexing a muscle that I had pretty well developed at the time because I've been podcasting for a long time, and it was my idea of journaling. I think maybe a dozen people ever listened to it. I think I might have done 20 episodes of it. So I, f I find a really interesting analog between you and I in that way. I wonder, because I felt worried about it, I guess would be the, the right term. I felt inadequate in a way. As someone who had only listened to Irvine's work, only because you didn't specify that you listened to more, when you sat down to create a podcast about stoicism or on the topic of stoicism, were you intimidated? Was that a scary experience? To an extent, yeah. Um, mostly because imposter syndrome kicks in. Because here, here's this massive thing that suddenly makes sense. It makes a lot of sense of like, this is how the world works. Uh, for me, I kind of liken stoicism as, as kind of like Neo in the Matrix, you know, because he has that point in there where he suddenly goes, wait, I can see everything behind the scenes. I can see how all of this works. And to me, that's kind of what stoicism does, because you start going, oh, okay, if I start applying stoicism to what this person did over here, it makes a lot more sense. I, I can see, I can actually have empathy for him because I can see the thought process that are going on in his head. So there was definitely a lot of imposter syndrome because here I am, you know, talking about it every day at that time. And was I good at it? Was I applying it well? Was I getting it all wrong and telling people the wrong thing? Right? It's got to be a huge concern. Yeah. And for me, I think the biggest concern was just that I struggle with so many things in my life that me getting up here and, and telling people this is how you live stoicism felt like I was, who am I to be the expert on that? And, you know, I talked with some friends about it and my ex-girlfriend who I'm so close friends with talked a lot about that. And she's just like, well, the thing is, is that you don't have to be perfect at it. You can be a great teacher at something and still suck at it. It's like how many psychologists, you know, who are alcoholics or, you know, who talk about, yeah, I was helping all these people and do these great things. And then it comes out that they had been struggling and they get divorced and different things like that. And I was like, well, okay. So I kind of had to reframe it in my mind that my goal with the podcast was not to say, look at me, I'm a great stoic. It was to say, hey, look at me, I'm a stoic who's trying, and this is how I'm making sense of these things, and doing my best to explain it in a way that's taking it from this very oftentimes cryptic or could be convoluted or esoteric format and turning it into a much more practical format for people. And that's kind of where I feel like I, I really hit my niche was that I get plenty of people who are like, you know, I tried studying stoicism and I came to your podcast and suddenly it started making sense to me. Or, you know... Uh, probably the most common thing I've gotten from the podcast, which for me is very humbling and very heartening, is how many people have written me saying, hey, I found your podcast at a very dark time in my life, and you literally saved my life. Because, you know, I was thinking of ending my life in a week or in a couple of weeks or something, and didn't see a way out and somehow stumbled on your podcast. And the fact that you struggle with these things, the fact that, you know, you talk about these things in a way that actually makes sense to me, gave me a lot more hope. And I feel like I'm, I'm making progress on it. And it's incredibly humbling and, and kind of thrilling when, you know, I receive emails like that. There is a really great parallel here. I, I don't have a better word than great, unfortunately, but I will bet you that a lot of my listeners feel about stoicism maybe the way you just described in general. When they approach it not to podcast on it, not to wax philosophical on it, but to approach it and to implement it. It's a very scary thing to feel like you might be implementing a philosophy incorrectly, because goodness knows where that might lead you. Do you have any general advice for someone who stumbles upon your show for the first time, stumbles upon my show for the first time, stumbles upon any stoic work for the first time, and thinks, hmm, this is a little heavy I don't know if I can do this. How did you ultimately push through that? And how do you think people who are new to the philosophy just as a concept might push through it? 
it's not it's not a sprint it's a marathon it's a lifelong thing it is something that you work on and practice and think about every single day and I think that the concepts are actually very very logical and very very clear I think where people get kind of off balance if you will or kind of off the path is when when they start acting like scriptorians so I I'll go on the reddit the stoicism reddit sometimes and I'll see people arguing about like these just ridiculous minutia. You know, what do they mean by this? What do they mean by that? Well, I think this. And then they start getting into flame wars with each other. You know, reasonably polite, but still kind of oftentimes very condescending or rude, but aggressively defending their point rather than going, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, and having a discussion about it. Like there was one where somebody posted something and said, what do you guys think about this? And then when people were like, well, this is what I think, he then he would kind of trash them and tell them how wrong they were. And then they would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you know, this is it. And he'd go, well, I don't see why you're saying this. I have a degree in philosophy. So I know better. And I'm like, then why did you ask the question if you really didn't want to hear what other people had to say? So I think a lot of it is don't get discouraged about how good or or perfect you do or don't live it. That was one of the problems that I had with Mormonism was that there's this ideal of perfection that is pushed out there. And if you don't toe this specific line, and if you aren't doing all of these things, then then you're imperfect and you are a terrible person. And what that really comes down to is that's that's an external judgment and an external yardstick that somebody else has put out there and said, hey, you need to live up to this. And I don't think you should ever need to do that. I think I think one of the scariest ideas, but one of the most powerful ideas that most of us never truly understand in our lives. And this comes from one of my favorite life coaches. Her name is Brooke Castillo. And she says, you are allowed to do anything and be anyone that you want to. You do not have to do what other people want you to do ever. And that is incredibly scary when you think about it and incredibly powerful. It means that if you are in an unhappy marriage, that you can leave at any time for any reason. You don't have to stay there. You know, you can do any of these things that you want. And we get so stuck in this frame of mind of all of these shoulds and things that we should do in our life or that we have to do in our lives. And we don't have to do any of these things. We can truly make all of these choices because these things are, are things that are under our control. Now, that does not mean you can control the consequences thereof. And that's the one thing where people confuse being able to do whatever you want with being able to control the consequences of things. I mean, we've we've seen examples of people who think they can do whatever they want, and then they get upset when the consequences aren't to their liking. Sure, a great example of that might be modern free speech conversations. I should have the ability to speak. Well, you do, but sometimes there are consequences for the things you say. Not necessarily from the government, because... That's not allowed here, but from other people who might not like what you have to say, certainly. Truly, you can say anything you want, but that doesn't mean that you can control what other people say or think back. It's like the Stoics talk about, you have no control over your reputation. So there's, you can't control what other people think of you. And to that point, you know, Brooke had a great quote. She's like, you know, what other people think of you is absolutely none of your business and not anything that you can control. So stop worrying about it. And I think that... But yes, I, I see that, and especially with the whole Twitter debacle that's going on right now, as we, you know, as it seems to be going down in flames. At least I think it'll limp along for another few years. Personal opinion, um, but I do see that there is that argument of I should be able to say whatever I want. It's like, yep, you can, but there are consequences to what you say. Sure, private companies can do. Thankfully, in some cases, private company things. Yeah. Well, so it sounds like when you started podcasting with Stoic Coffee Break, it was a very different mission. In fact, there didn't really even seem to be a mission so much as a self-exploration. The mission certainly has developed over time. What would you say the reason for continuing the Stoic Coffee Break podcast is at this point? What are you trying to accomplish now? Kind of two things. Um, And one of them I I would say is kind of selfish. One of them is that I find that, or at least I found that when I wasn't doing the podcast, that... Not necessarily that my my continued self-improvement that I have stopped, because that's just something that's, I think, a natural part of who I am. When I was in high school, I was very unhappy. So my fa- my home life was very volatile. My dad uh, was a very violent person and had a lot of demons that, that he never really resolved before he died. And so it was 
it was a it was a messy place, and so I was very unhappy. Plus, I was living in this very strict culture that I didn't feel like I fit in, but I felt horrible about myself because I couldn't live up to these really high standards that were set out there. But I always had this feeling that I would be able to figure out somehow how to be happy because I knew people who were genuinely happy, who weren't like the fake happy, like, hi, it's so good to see you and putting on airs like that, but were truly, honestly, genuinely in their hearts, just very content and happy. And so I was always on a mission to, to do that. And so when I stopped doing the podcast, I find that there's less time and focus on getting deeper into some of those issues. And so each episode that I work on, for the most part, is really just an exploration of something I'm struggling with at that time. I would say that probably 80% of the time that what you see in an episode or what you hear in an episode is something that I was struggling with in the two or three weeks prior to that. Occasionally, I'll just have an idea where I'm like, oh, this is a really fascinating idea. I want to explore this. But oftentimes, and most times, the ideas just come from you know, this is shit I'm dealing with in my life and I need to figure this out. So I'm going to sit down and continue working on this. And oftentimes that's why you'll see things repeated because, you know, an idea is repeated, you know, because that repetition and that going back over it, it's, you know, going through with a fine tooth comb and reminding ourselves of these things, I think is really important. So there's one aspect of it that's selfish because it's my own public therapy, as I like to call it. Um, But on the other side, there's meaning to it. And I think that so my day job is I work as a software developer, and it's it's fine, but I'm kind of reaching that point where it's kind of boring, um, where it doesn't – I mean, it still challenges me because it's it's a balance of uh, creative and analytical thinking, which is really nice for me. Sure. I worked in IT for about 20 years, and, you know, if you have to fix a printer – a thousand times you've only fixed that printer once it's it's a little self-defeating it's it's a depressing job at times for sure yeah and so i'm in software development and you know i keep writing kind of the joke is we write the same app you know 10 different times and so i think the other part of it for me is that it does give me a kind of meaning something more meaningful in my life to work on because of the impact that it does have on other people you know when i get these messages on instagram or facebook you know or you know, people sending me messages saying, hey, I really appreciate the podcast and this is what it's really done for me. So I think that that it's changed as far as that goes. And so I'm looking at ways to kind of take that same idea and push a little bit more forward. And so I'm working on, you know, I'm working on possibly, you know, putting together a community. I did that about a year and a half ago. But I, again, I had too many things in my life that were just kind of chaotic and and things were kind of falling apart in some of my personal life. And so I just had to take a, a back seat on that and shut it down. But I think that I've gotten more things kind of in line that, you know, working on a community, putting some courses together. Um, I've got some ideas on, you know, I've got an idea for a book that I definitely want to write and turn into a course which I think will be interesting. And I think that I'll learn a lot from doing that. And hopefully the things that I learn, I'm able to share with people in a way that that they're able to apply it in their own lives really well. I know that we will talk more about those future plans at the end of this episode, because I want to give you a chance to fully flesh out what you're planning. As for the time being, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more with Eric Cloward of the Stoic Coffee Break. And we're back with Eric Cloward. Eric, before the break, we were talking a little bit about your history, how you came to podcasting, how you came to Stoicism in particular, what your current mission is with the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. There was one more question I wanted to ask you relevant to your start, and I guess that's maybe more about where you are now. When you entered Stoicism, you knew, for all intents and purposes, nothing, just like everybody knows nothing when they start anything new, when they go to learn anything new. Do you feel like there's still something within the Stoic doctrine, so to speak, that you feel that you have the weakest understanding of still, that you're still struggling to understand? And then what's the opposite of that? What's something you feel that you really comprehend well? Wow, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I think there are t- kind of two, and I, they both, strangely enough, they both kind of fit in the same category, or each category, different aspects of them. And the hardest part, I think, and this is something that most people, when they get into stoicism, is probably one of the hardest things, and that's understanding the idea of control, the, the dichotomy of control, what you do control and what you don't control. And because we have so much in our lives that we think we have control over. And, you know, if you ask somebody, you know, do you have control over this? Do you have control over that? And when we really get down to it, there's so very little that we control. It's almost almost astounding, I guess, because, you know, we think we have so much control over things. I mean, you know, people think they have control over their bodies. You know, I go to the gym, I do all of these things like, yeah, but can you control if you get a cold or not? Can you make that cold just stop because you don't want it there? You get a cold, you know, it's going to run its course. You can influence it. You can do something about it, you can make sure that you take, you know, take care of your things. But the thing that you don't have control over is your actual body. 
would you have control over is what you do with it. And, you know, if you decide you want to rest up when you have a cold, if you take medicine for it, so on, etc. But I think understanding what we do and don't have control over is probably one of the hardest things to kind of wrap your brain around it. And there are times when I think, oh, yeah, I've got this figured out. And then I will try and control something that I don't have control over. I'll, you know, I'll get angry at somebody and be like trying to, you know, cajole them into my point of view or coming to do what I want them to do. And then, you know, then they'll point out, it's like, why do you keep trying to control me? I'm like, well, I'm not. I, I yeah, okay, yeah, I am trying to control you. And that's not something that I actually have control over. So understanding that is is one thing. Actually doing it and implementing it, I think, is another. And I think that can be true with about anything. There are a lot of triggers for it as well, right? I mean, we live in a very politically dis- divisive country. You and I both live in the United States. Mm-hmm. But I think political divisivism, if that's a word, is somewhat widespread at this point with the advent of the internet. We've seen people disagree to a greater extent than perhaps we've ever seen them disagree. They've probably disagreed the same amount through history. We just haven't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had a Twitter. Yeah, exactly. But also, there's a struggle with the ego in general, right? Because part of what makes us feel I think as human beings, that our life has meaning, I think something that's tied into that is an idea of having agency. And we do, of course, have some agency. There are things that we can control, the agency over our thoughts and our emotions, excluding, of course, the primordial emotions, so to speak. But it's more often than not that most things in our life are completely out of our control, out of our ability to have any real specific influence over. And that can be, it almost feels like admitting a kind of weakness, doesn't it, at first? Yeah, absolutely. It it makes you feel incredibly small. Like, wow, I they, there's just so much that happens in the world and I can't, we fool ourselves into thinking we have control over all of these things. Whereas, you know, and that's the idea behind Momento Mori. It's like, sure, you may think you're invincible, but you could just walk outside and die of a heart attack or a train, your car stops on the train track or you get hit by a car or mudslide happens. I mean, there's so many things that you absolutely have no control over. And I think as part of our ego protection, we ignore these things, we downplay these things, we minimize these things in all kinds of ways, or in a way, pretend that we do have control over them when we absolutely do not. So how do we avoid, or how have you, I should, I should say, I'm not asking you to be prescriptive, but how does an individual, you, prevent themselves from sliding into the dark hole of nihilistic, kind of hedonist view of life when once, rather, you admit to yourself that there is such a great amount of things in life that you can't control. How do you not lose, oh, there's a purpose to life in that giving up of control or acceptance of control? Because I have seen people come to stoicism and say, well, now, wait a minute, if I don't have any control, I mean, what's the point? Why should I even effort? Why does work matter? How can anything matter? If I really don't have any control, what do my actions matter anyway? And there's some conflict just in Stoicism in general because we have the fact that Stoics were were deterministic, but they were also compatibilists. And that in itself is a very confusing thing to understand. But for you, how does that work? How do you manage to prevent yourself, and especially early on, how did you manage to prevent yourself from becoming more nihilistic than you were Stoic? Yeah, that's that's a... A tough thing that I do see from time to time, because if you do look at it that way of like, well, there, everything that we do matters and nothing that we do matters. Because everything that you do when you die, basically at that point and, you know, 100 years past, anything that you did probably really won't matter. And, you know, at some point, you know, our, our galaxy is going to implode or, you know, our sun is going to go supernova and this planet will no longer be here. Our our essence, the whatever we are, the spirit, soul, whatever you, you consider you as, a, as an entity outside of your physical being, we have no idea what happens with that. So, yeah, it can be easy just to fall into nihilism, like, eh, nothing matters. But at the same time, everything matters. Everything you do matters in that it's not the end goal of the thing, but it's how you, you know, they always say, you know, it's the journey that matters. And it truly is. It really, as cliche as that sounds, how you live your life and the kind of person you are truly does matter. Because if everybody took on that attitude, then we may as well just nuke the planet, you know, and that's what the kind of the nihilists are all about. Like, you know, what's the point of anything? But I think really what it comes down to is if you step back and just take the, the approach that the only reason that you have in life, you know, to live and to do whatever it is that you're going to do is a reason you choose. And to me, there's a lot of power in that because then you are not compelled to do anything. You don't have to do anything. 
but you get to choose what you want to do. You get to make choices to decide to step up and be a better person, to start that podcast or to write that book or to volunteer in a soup kitchen or whatever it is that you want to do in your life. You don't have to have a reason for it. You can just do it because you want to, because you desire it, because you think it's kind of a cool idea. You want to write comic books for a living. Fine, do that too. Whatever it is that you want to do, you don't have to have a reason for it. And I think that we as humans, we like to have reasons for why we do things. We like to have, well, I did this because of X, Y, and Z, or I'm doing this because of X, Y, and Z. You don't have to have a reason for doing any of those things. I think that's very freeing because then you're, again, you have the choice to do those things and you're not compelled to do any of those things. So is there a good way to step out of nihilism? I'm not sure. I think that that's something that everybody has to grapple with themselves. And it's really just deciding that you're generally happier, you feel better morally, you feel better emotionally when you decide to live a life that's more virtuous, if you will. At least that's been my own experience, that when I step up to the plate and do the, you know, live those values and principles that I think are important, the self-satisfaction that I feel is is great. Sure. Maybe a good analog for it is... It doesn't necessarily feel good to sit on the couch and eat ice cream all day. I mean, there's a certain joy to that, right? Some sort of overindulgence. There's some pleasure in eating ice cream all day. But I think anybody who's ever had like a real unhealthy day has felt the ramifications of that over, you know, the next 24 hours, for example, versus what someone feels like after they do kind of the struggle of going to the gym or eating healthy. This is especially close to me because as I work to become a healthier eater, a more responsible eater, I can absolutely see what it feels like to not care about what I'm putting in my body and and what I feel like uh, intellectually, mentally, the, the haze that comes into the brain kind of when you don't eat well and the general feeling of lethargy or just not caring. But I am not doing it. It doesn't matter, right? Like nothing matters and I can do whatever I want. But at the same time, when I decide that it feels better to eat better, to exercise a little bit, my brain is sharper. I get better sleep. In the end, am I going to die? Well, yeah, of course. But I think the fact that we're going to die means we have such a limited amount of time, an unknown limited amount of time to do anything, to frolic in the daisies, so to speak, right? And we might as well make the most of that time while we have it. And Stoicism would ask that we use that time to do virtuous things, help our neighbors, help ourselves, be healthy. What else is there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because if you if you build a company and you make a billion dollars and then you die, so what? You can't take that with you. But, you know, so again, it's that thing of that it's what are you going to place your value on? Are you going to place your value on all of the things that you have? Are you going to place your value on the type of person you are? You know, I mean, that's, I think... One of the reasons why, like the Spartans, that legend lives on is so inspiring is because they understood that the only thing that could damage them was dishonor, that death didn't matter. Dishonor mattered more than dying. And because they believed that so strongly, they were willing to step up and go give their lives, you know, in this very epic battle. I mean, the battle, you know, the, at the hot gates at Thermopylae, that was probably one of the most important battles in all of history. And the reason why is because the Persians were coming in to basically crush Greece. And keeping a free Greece was exceptionally important because that's where a lot of our philosophical traditions, uh, mathematics, you know, all types of things came from that. And if Persia had taken that over, we have no idea if those things and ideas would have survived. Democracy would have survived. So I think that that small battle, which may seem small in, in, you know, in the larger things compared to World War II, all of these other things, was probably one of the most significant that there ever was. And part of the reason why it is so inspiring for us is because, you know, it's like they say, if it can, the only thing that, that can truly hurt you is if it hurts your character. We wouldn't have stoicism. Yeah. I would think not. We wouldn't have this podcast. This would have <laughs> impacted us very specifically. Yeah, because it was 400 years, it was about 460 BCE, I think. And then I think Epictetus was like 50 AD or something. I can't remember when he was born. I, I'm kind of fuzzy on the dates. But Seneca was was basically lived at the what they consider about the time of Christ as well. So a lot of these things we would probably would not have had if the Persians had been in charge. Well, maybe this leads us to something that you suggested that we bring up during our discussion, which was the idea of self-deception and the danger that self-deception poses. I think you probably mean to the self, but also to a community or to our communities where we live. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah. I mean, it's something that I'm, I've been thinking kind of long and hard about. And in the idea that we, we fool ourselves and lie to ourselves constantly, 
we have internal impressions of who we think we are and who we want to be and and what you know what we are in the world what action what our actions do to other people and so on so the idea of self deception is not necessarily that we are going out of our way to try and deceive ourselves but the idea that it's very very challenging to truly know who you are deep down inside and to understand those things because oftentimes we will espouse a certain idea or want to hold a certain principle and yet our behavior seems almost contradictory to that at times and you know we, we kind of wonder to ourselves like well if i think i'm a person that is like x but i continue to do y which is the opposite of x or shows that i don't believe in x what does that really say about me and so i think a lot of our self deception comes in because of our ego i think that we are driven so much more by our unco- by our unconscious than than most of us would like to admit there was a theory of consciousness that i read about recently from a neurobiologist where he talked about the idea that is positing the hypothesis that we don't actually experience anything truly consciously that really what we are experiencing is a split second remembering of what just happened that you know and which is which is kind of a scary thought in a way because it's like well am i then am i not making any choices in my life and this guy works with alzheimer's patients and dementia and all kinds of you know different maladies of the brain and it's a theory that he's working on putting together. And some of the it made sense of some of the ideas of like why we have deja vu, for example, uh, why it's so hard to control our thoughts at times. You know, they just bounce around. And we're like, why did I just suddenly think of a you know a purple dog bouncing on a pogo stick? I, where did that come from? You know, just things like that. And so for me, that that kind of struck a chord because I was like, huh, does that mean that we are truly driven by more by our unconscious than our conscious choices? And if so, then what can we do to be more influential on our unconscious so that we can develop those things, those habits, those ideas, those things we need to do to live the way that we want to? And so I think that's kind of my idea of, of what I've been kind of delving into that self-deception is we have this idea of who we think we are, but if that's truly who we are, why don't we do exactly everything that we want to do in the way that we want to do? Why do we do things like sit on a couch and eat ice cream all day? You know, why do we, you know, why do we, why do we have these self-defeating things? It's, it's kind of an interesting idea and I'm kind of digging into that and trying to understand that a little bit better and think of ways to know ourselves better and to try and understand who we truly are. And a lot of that has to do with self-acceptance. And I think that that is probably one of the hardest things for most people is to truly accept themselves because there are so many dark things that we don't want to see about ourselves. And so we won't, we, because we can't admit to those things, we can't accept those things because those things are bad, those things are wrong, those things are, you know, whatever we label is something that is not, not who we want to be. This is actually something that I've spoken about a little bit on this podcast, which is people are generally, it seems, afraid And I think Stoicism is a really good solve for this. I I think perhaps it's one of the things I like most about the philosophy. I have studied and read a number of philosophies, not to the extent that I've studied or read Stoicism, but I find Stoicism to be unique in in being a solve, as in, I guess I should say a solve, S-A-L-V-E, for this kind of problem. When we're silent, and I mean literally silent, when we don't have something to distract us, like a television show, a friend, us talking to ourselves, we're on a road trip and we can't shut up, right? When we don't have something to distract us, we can only have our thoughts. And I think most people, this included me before I found Stoicism and many years into finding Stoicism and taking it seriously, our thoughts are not kind to us. And partially that can have to do with self-doubt. It can have to do with imposter syndrome. It can be things we're creating problems out of. And Stoicism can help us to identify those things and say, hey, well, that's not true. You are ascending to an impression and you shouldn't be doing that. But then other things are actual legitimate problems. I recently stopped drinking, not because I felt I had a formal alcoholic type problem with drinking, but because I did some real thinking about, is this a good use of my time? Is this particularly healthy? I listened to a great podcast called The Huberman Lab, all about drinking and what it does to your body. And I came away from that podcast thinking, I don't want to stop drinking. That's one of the social things. That's how I hang out with people and have fun. But does it hurt? Oh, it's hurting. I don't like thinking about this. I don't like having to make this decision because, and and this is something that happens when you take any philosophy seriously. I don't think it's unique to Stoicism. It's any philosophy that you really commit yourself to. You find yourself falling down a certain path of reasoning. And once you've adopted it as being your 
codex of reasoning, I guess, you kind of trap yourself in a way that I think is beneficial. So I recently read Kai Whiting's paper on stoic ethics related to eating. And after reading that paper, I was like, damn it. I think I have to become a vegetarian. I think I have to do that. And I've been really struggling with that decision. I actually made the decision on Thanksgiving. And I'm like, am I actually going to do this? I love bacon. One of my sponsors on the podcast has previously been ButcherBox. Do I really want to become a vegetarian? But the question begins to become not, is this a thing I want to do? It becomes a, how committed am I to this philosophy that I've committed some of my life to? Am I going to abandon it now because it's difficult? And you start to have the, those confrontations when you shut up and you start asking yourself questions and, and worrying about things. So I think everything you've said there is, it gives everybody maybe a moment to pause and really, really think pretty heavily about that. What are some things you know you're not doing that you should be doing? And for the record, I'm not saying that you or anyone listening needs to become a vegetarian to be a quote unquote true stoic. I'm just saying that having that kind of conversation with yourself is incredibly important. I think you've brought up a great point there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is um, definitely a big crux of it is that, you know, you may espouse, I want to live this virtuous life, but you have blind spots on the areas that you don't. And can you rationally, logically, clearly look at those things without judgment and just say, hmm, if I say that I'm going to do X, what do I think a person who does X does? Am I doing those things? And just, you know, not with any judgment, but just a, a clarity. And that's one of the things that I like about Stoicism is that it works really hard to just get at the facts of things. And I had this in a podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was talking about nonviolent language and or nonviolent communication. And one of the things that I like about that and is very Stoic is the author talks about when you are discussing something with someone, can you just strictly talk about the facts? purely factual and get rid of any opinion, get rid of any judgment in what you're talking about. And I think Stoicism does a pretty good job with that. And that's that idea of, you know, understanding that you have all these opinions and judgments about everything that you don't think are judgments and opinions, but they really are. And so if you can get to the facts of things, you know, like, and that's where I think the the idea of acceptance, you know, like I said, it's acceptance, self-deception, all of these things fit in, is that the more you can look at yourself as in a factual way, just an honest, true way, without judgment, I think the easier it is to get past a lot of those things. And so I think that the more honest you can be with yourself and the more accepting you can be with yourself of, okay, this is who I am, the less the ego gets in the way and the less you have to worry about that self-deception because, you know, we all have that friend who knows they're kind of a jerk, but they own it. And we, but, but we love them and appreciate them because they own the fact that they don't like this thing and that they are opinionated about this thing. And they will, and if you call them out on it, they go, absolutely. I am totally this way. And I know that about myself. And we, but, but we love them and appreciate them because they own the fact that they don't like this thing and that they are opinionated about this thing. And they will, and if you call them out on it, they go, absolutely. I am totally this way. And I know that about myself. And you, but you can still have a lot of respect for that person because they're honest about who they are. Yeah, intellectual integrity, I think, is increasingly rare, but also increasingly appreciated. So we're going to take one more break, and then we'll come back for a few more minutes with Eric Cloward. Stay with us. And we are back with Eric Cloward from the Stoic Coffee Break podcast. Eric, before we wrap up today, I want to get a couple of things from you. I want to get some book recommendations for the listeners, because I know you've got some. I also want to talk about what the future plans are for not just the Coffee Break podcast, but for some of the other things you've got planned from a writing perspective and a courses and teaching perspective, because I think anybody who listens to this show is always on the lookout for other great resources. I obviously can't provide even one-tenth of all the great resources necessary to help someone practice stoicism well. Talk about your writing ambitions, because you've got some. Yeah. So I've actually, uh, over the years as I've worked on this, um, you know, I've got a lot of content as I've worked through the all the podcast episodes. And so some of it is trying to find a good format and way to bring that into another medium. So not everybody's into podcasts, whereas plenty of people are into reading and courses and other things like that. So I've got some ideas on that. Um, and I've got some some basic outlines and structures of actually several books, but one in particular that I've got a great idea for, and I'm not giving away the title because I think it's it's a great title, and it's one of those things where, yeah, it'll be fun to see what comes with that. Um, 
But along with that, creating a course around the book as well as a community around that. And it's something probably uh, I'll be working on in the next two or three months. So I've got a lot going on, but that's something that I think it's time. I think it's time just to kind of take all this material and these great ideas and everything and, and try to uh, bring them in a consolidated form, kind of up my game on that and see how that helps other people. Well, I've definitely found that when people come to trust you and consume your content for long enough that as soon as you give them something that is an extension of that value, if we want to word it that way, they love the opportunity to get more than you can already provide them. And of course, a podcast is a medium by which you're limited in what you can provide. It's voice only. Whereas you have a community, which you're also thinking about building, you get the opportunity to really interact with people one-on-one, which is what I enjoy about my own community is that people pop in there, talk to each other, which is fun to watch as not just as a content creator and not just as a stoic, but as a person who is also still learning. I learn things from my listeners who are here to learn things from me. And I look at a conversation the two of them are having in the Discord server and it's like, oh, well, I had never thought of that. Maybe you should be running this show. So that's a fun, fun aspect as well. How about book recommendations? You've got some for us. Yeah. So they seem kind of odd, but they all fit in with stoicism in different ways. So the first one is nonviolent communication, which is by Marshall Rosenberg. Uh, He passed away a while back, but it's It's an incredibly influential book about how to communicate with others by removing the judgments and opinions in how well you're communicating, or at the very least, being cognizant of those. And I think it's an incredible book about how to be more conscientious about how you speak. He also kind of uh, calls it uh, conscious communication. And so that's one thing that I'd really recommend. Uh, The next one is probably one of the most stoic books on leadership that I've ever read, even though it doesn't mention stoicism once in it. But it's called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. And Diana Chapman is kind of the main author on that, as well as uh, Jim Detmer and Kaylee Warner Klemp. And as you go through each of these commitments that they talk about, you really kind of get a feel for applied stoicism in kind of a corporate sense, if you will, or a business sense. And if you took kind of the business angle out of it, you could really just call it the five commitments of conscious living or 15 commitments of conscious living. But it's definitely one of the more influential books that I've ever read. Um, It was given to me years ago by a friend of mine. And I I read a little bit of it and put it on the shelf and then um, was listening to another podcast and Diana was on there talking about it. And I'm like, wait a second, I think I have that book. And just so enjoyed the podcast with her. And I went and picked the book back up and basically read it in about four days and just just couldn't put it down as far as those things go, because it was really, really thought provoking and just a very practical way to implement stoicism in your life and your companies. So that's one one that I definitely recommend. And then the last one is Existential Kink, which I know sounds very provocative title and she meant it to be that way. And it's by Carolyn Elliott. And what this one is, is it's very much about shadow work and the idea of understanding the darker side of you and working on accepting that and appreciating that dark side of you rather than looking at it as a horrible thing and something that needs to be shunned and and shut down, that recognizing that you're a whole person and you've got this light and you've got this dark. And until you start accepting that, you're going to cause a lot of problems. And she uses a quote in there all the time, and she refers back to it over and over and over by Jung, and it says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. And I think that's an incredibly powerful thing because, again, there's so many times where we have a conscious principle or idea of the way that we want to be, and yet our behavior and our reactions to things are very antithetical to that, and we have a hard time understanding that. And until we can learn to accept those darker parts of us, those things are going to express themselves in very unusual ways. So that, that for me, is just an absolutely fantastic book. So links to those books that Eric mentioned will be in the show notes. Go check them out. If they're up your alley, buy them. Give them a read. Eric, before you leave, I want to ask you, if you could give a single piece of advice to the folks listening about a great way to instill a daily stoic practice, just something they could do every day that you think would be stoically beneficial to them, what would that piece of advice be? Mm, I'm going to sound like a cliche here, but a few months ago when I was really struggling with some stuff, I decided that I needed to make some pretty radical changes in, in some things. And what I did was I sat down for 60 days and I meditated for an hour and it was hard. 
Doing that for an hour was really, really challenging. But at the end of 60 days, I felt like I had a better handle on the chaos in my mind because we always have these chaotic thoughts going around. I don't have time to do the hour a day, even though I wish I did. But I found that when I let my meditation practice slide completely, things kind of descended back into a bit more chaos. I mean, it's not massively chaotic, but things weren't flowing the way that I I wanted to. And I, I was struggling to kind of break through some of the problems I was struggling with. So even just sitting down and honestly just doing a meditation for 10 minutes a day. I mean, I do mine for 30 minutes a day, but I recommend at least 10 because until you learn to master your thinking and to know how your brain works and to just see how the thoughts kind of run rampant around in your head, you've got this great tool, but you're not really aware of what it's doing. And so that type of practice, that meditation practice is exceptionally important. And even if you just sit down and you're quiet for 10 minutes and you just kind of let your mind be bored and let it wander and do all of its things, that's fine because you're paying attention and you're letting your mind be bored because our society is so built on always being engaged all the time. So taking some time out and just letting your brain be bored for a while and letting it just kind of wander is exceptionally important. It's like, that's why we, they call them shower thoughts. When you have these great ideas or incredible insights when you're in the shower because you can't do anything else except, you know, soap up, which is a very, very robotic practice or automated. You know exactly what to do. So sitting down and meditating every single day, even if it's just 10 minutes to 30 minutes, is probably one of the greatest things that you can do. Eric Cloward of the Stoic Coffee Break podcast, I want to thank you very much for coming by and spending what I'm sure at this point is probably over an hour talking with me, of all people. I really do appreciate it. No, I really appreciate it. You, you're great conversationist. I've really enjoyed this. And I've enjoyed some of your insights into stoicism. I know you kind of put yourself down about it, but I think you have a I think you have a good grasp of these things. And I really appreciate the way that you explain them and help others learn them. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate you as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Practical Stoicism. I appreciate you being here. If you haven't yet subscribed to this show, hit subscribe or follow or whatever the button says in the app you're listening so that you get new episodes the minute they come out. Also, if you've not reviewed the show, I would appreciate you doing so. You can review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or at podchaser.com. Thank you again for listening today, and until next time, take care. Take care.